Hello and welcome to Fresh Air. I'm Joe. I'm Dave. I'm Chris. And I'm Andy. And tonight we are going to be covering off knowledge and certainty. This is a continuation from our previous video about beliefs and propositional logic. So, welcome back or hello for the first time. Uh, as with the previous podcast, we will try and describe everything so you don't need the visual. Uh, however, we will provide this as a PDF and put the video up as well for anyone that needs to it or wants to view it that way. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, what is knowledge? Knowledge can be defined as a justified true belief. But what really does that mean? True is a fact. It's in accordance with reality. A belief is something accepted as true or a positive attitude towards a proposition. Justified, something shown to be correct or rational. There are of course other definitions of knowledge. The justified true belief or JTB is only one epistemological theory of knowledge and is considered the most basic of all. We will use and discuss the JTB definition for the bulk of this uh, as it is the most relatable to propositional logic and rationality but we ought to briefly cover the others. Coherence theory, fallibilism, verificationism and positivism. Coherence theory is essentially the idea of looking at everything you believe or claim to know and making sure it is consistent and coherent with everything else you know. Essentially, each belief is built on a previous set of beliefs set on previous other sets of beliefs. These could be represented in a circular wheel of beliefs, B1, B2, B3, meaning that we don't hit an infinite regress. So as an example of coherence theory, I know I am going to get a poor night's sleep tonight. I don't have any sleeping pills. I have also had tramadol, which keeps me awake. And I tend to sleep poorly because I suffer with insomnia. Uh, this is oddly apt considering as today I actually have had to take tramadol to a, for a back spasm. But this is an example of a number of uh, beliefs that all sort of link together and we can say that I know that this is going to be the case under coherence theory. So this works in the same way as a logical process. It's P1, P2, P3, therefore C1. Well, it's it's to make sure that they are all linked to together. So uh, as long as all of them are consistent with each other, then that makes sense. Whereas if P1 contradicts P2, then obviously you can't have your conclusion. It would mean that you'd have an inconsistent belief going on there. Yep, that makes sense. So fallibilism. Broadly speaking, fallibilism is the philosophical claim that no belief can have justification which guarantees the truth of the belief. However, not all fallibilists believe that fallibilism extends to all domains of knowledge. Essentially, we could consider that something can be considered to be true and is knowledge until it is proven false. There are a number of reasons from the fallibility of the senses, perception, or even people in general, not to mention it is hard to define what is really true and prove it so. In a sense, fallibilism could be said to differentiate between not false and true. I know the speed limit outside my house is 80 kilometers an hour. Your neighbour petitioned the town to change it to 60 because one of her children almost got hit. 
there is construction on the water main across the road and it's now 60 because it is a construction zone so in this instance you considered it true until you were shown that okay no it is now false so that's kind of the same idea as the peer review process for scientific papers right uh yeah it's essentially um false Popper's falsification basically came from fallibilism uh so next we have verificationism verificationism essentially states that a proposition is only cognitively meaningful if it can be definitively and conclusively determined to be either true or false. One of the benefits of verificationism is that it can be used out many things as meaningless, like the God or religion debate, as there is nothing definitive or conclusive about any of them. In some respects, I see a slight parity to uh, Huxley's agnostic method in the sense that we should not say we believe or know that which we have no scientific evidence for. Uh, Huxley encourages suspending judgment until such time that we have said evidence, whereas ver verificationism regards it as meaningless. Uh, we could note a problem with statements like all things are made of atoms because we cannot verify all things actually are. We have the knowledge of everything we know about being made of atoms and then the knowledge of the composition of all things. We cannot actually verify this. So with statements like that, we could even go back to leaning on fallibilism or Popper's falsification. Uh, we have verified this as much as we can and we will assume it's true until such time as it can be proved true. But this obviously shows uh, a, a big issue with verificationism on its own so this goes to try and rid the problem of induction whereas with other forms you could say there are no black swans but because we hadn't seen every swan we couldn't say that it it would essentially become a meaningless statement in in that sense because you cannot necessarily verify that yes yeah, it'd be very difficult to maintain that as your only position of knowledge. Uh, most definitely, yeah. Uh, I, I think one of the things, going through all the different theories of knowledge, they all basically represent the same sort of thing, and they all have parts which work really well, but not necessarily in all circumstances. Did you have a, a discussion with someone that said... Well, if you can't prove it, I don't believe it recently. Uh, I honestly cannot remember now. Can't so. remember. <laughs> oh, fair enough. He might have, but if you can't prove he did, then... <laughs> I, I can't verify that, so... I don't have any knowledge of it. And so the last one to cover off is positivism. Positivism is a philosophical system deeply rooted in science and maths. It is based on the idea that anything that exists can be verified through experiment, observation and mathematical or logical proof. Everything without empirical or logical data therefore does not exist. Like verificationism, it regards things as true, false or meaningless. A meaningless statement would be one that isn't clear enough to be tested meaningfully. The smell of Chris's turquoise. The colour of jade humps like a rabbit. Of course, these are quite stupid examples, and there are less silly examples that can fit this meaningless category too. For example, gods. Statement it does sound like something Eddie Izzard would say, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and to be fair, we all know I smell of beige. <laughs> to be fair your hair would probably smell of turquoise right now to be fair yeah, yeah hopefully uh, yeah that wasn't intentional at all it was just a happy coinky dink so statements that are not meaningless will fall into the category of true or false but we might not necessarily know which 
I think I left the bathroom light on. That is something that will either be true or false. One in three houses have a dog. Would the I them? think one be considered true or false? Because you would say it's true, but you think you did. Uh, yes, so the, the, the thought bit would be true, but having left the light on is the is the, the proposition that we're considering there. You're believing that you have left the light on, and that will be something that is either true or false, but you don't necessarily know it. It's not a meaningless statement under positivism, but until you go and actually view it, you don't know if it, you have left the light on or not. Or if you're like me with locking the door when you leave the house, where I have to go back and check four times before I actually believe it to be true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know that one. <laughs> I've, I, I'm the same with the car. If I've left the car and you press lock about four times just to make sure, don't you? Yeah, you have to, just in case. And then even if you have someone comes along with a, a saw and steals your catalytic converter anyway. <laughs> So lastly, we've also got the colloquial definitions of knowledge. They can be more than a little vague. Things you know. Facts, information and skills acquired through experience or education. The theoretical or practical understanding of a subject. Awareness or familiarity gained by experience of a fact or situation. So... Here we need to actually put in the split of information versus knowledge. Many conflate having information or being aware of facts as knowledge. However, there is a difference between knowing something and having knowledge in this sense. The square root of 196 is 14. This is true. This is information. But if you don't have the understanding as to why this is the case, how square roots work, can we really call that knowledge? Next we have awareness versus knowledge. Many conflate being aware of something with knowledge. Consider being aware of stories in the Bible. You could say you know the stories, but this isn't knowledge of the events they describe under any of the knowledge theories we've discussed. What we do know is there's no evidence of stories like Noah's flood happening circa 4 to 6k years ago, as some would assert. Or at all. Well, there are... There are... So about seven and a half thousand years ago, yeah, there was a massive Mediterranean flood. Agree on it being a global or local flood. About 20,000 I mean, yeah. years ago, there was the ice sheets receding and therefore it did cause the sea level to rise and all of the coastal towns would have got flooded through this thing. So it potentially 20,000 years ago, it would have seemed like a worldwide flood and seven and a half thousand years ago that mediterranean flood to people who have never left the mediterranean might have felt like that was a worldwide flood too but all the same the people that are saying it happened four to six thousand years ago are still wrong even if we make a charitable allowance for these different floods you still also get um sea life fossils up in the mountains sometimes where continental drift has happened and um the, the plates have kind of uh, shoved together and formed mountains, etc. Yeah, definitely. And obviously we're not Pangaea anymore, so... <laughs> Which is the big continent before, uh, before it all moved. And there you go. Next week's video will be Andy doing <laughs> tectonic talking, plates. Talking, <laughs> talking shit about dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> So Pangaea is the big continent before they all split, not that Correct. little bit of skin between the butthole and the scrotum. Now that's your perineum, isn't it? <laughs> that's the trouble. That, that explains why I got such that's weird looks at the baby. pub quiz. <laughs> the justified true belief or knowledge. So what counts as justification? 
The justification must match the claim. This is one of the problems, as many feel justified and claim knowledge, when really they barely met the justification to make the belief rational, let alone have a justification to make the claim of knowledge. The justification can include, but does not always have to include all, and is also not limited to, logical thought process and strong reasoning. Evidence, understanding, verification, proof. These are just a few examples of things that can count as justification. So a few examples of justification. Justification can be used for both knowledge and belief. As we mentioned in the last episode, the burden of proof for a belief is to justify the belief as rational. In some instances, the justification for a belief is enough to ju justify the knowledge, but in others, the belief may be rational, but we might not call it knowledge. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples here. Example one is Joe tells Dave he has lost his sunglasses. Dave's justification is he knows Joe tends not to lie and in fact hates lying. This is not something someone would tend to lie about. Joe has nothing to gain from de telling Dave this. Is Dave correct to say that he knows Joe has lost his sunglasses under the JTB? If yes. it's true, then yes. So you're all in pretty much agreement with that one then? I mean, it would depend on the theory of testimony, but yeah. Awesome. Well, then it looks like we're in agreement. Ding! <laughs> the only problem would be there's also the knowledge claim of saying you tend not to lie, where that could be a carefully constructed facade that you put up. And actually, you lie all the time. But only fact, about stuff that doesn't matter and no one's going to ever find out about. <laughs> like this could be the, the case. Sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on to you, Joe. And you're lying about sunglasses. My hope is if I, if I tell this lie enough, someone will finally buy me a new pair. You see, that's what I'm trying to get out of it. You need to start printing out posters and putting them up around the local area. <laughs> real, like, like lend some real credence to it. <laughs> Have you seen this pair of glasses? Goes by the name of Ray. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'd ban me soon enough. Example number two. Chris tells Andy he fought off two muggers at the weekend. Andy's justification is he knows Chris is a martial arts instructor. He has seen a picture on Facebook with Chris with a black eye. Chris gains nothing from Andy by telling him this except for maybe a little bit of respect. Is Andy correct to say he knows Chris fought off two muggers at the weekend? I, I would say I believed that. Yeah. I'd say that one's tougher because he doesn't know if I'm a good martial arts instructor. <laughs> <laughs> And he's heard stories of my kids, so there are other reasons I could have a black eye. <laughs> this is true. But for the sake of the conversation, would you be in agreement? Yes. Yeah. I would say yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. I'm glad we're in agreement on that one too. <laughs> so the last example of this uh, justification. A barman asks the age of a young lady before serving her a drink. She says she is 18. The barman's justification is, she's pretty. She has friends who have ID. Consider, though, that she does have something to gain by lying about her age, and all the risk is on the barman. He has never seen her before. In this instance, I think some form of evidence would be required. Is he justified in saying she, he knows she is over 18? Fuck no. Did she give him a blowjob first? <laughs> Would that change does, her does age? Does he know that she's over 16 first? <laughs> cool. So we're all in agreement uh, on that one as well then, really. 
No, I'm going to argue just to be a pain in the ass. Go for it. <laughs> no, no, I'm only joking. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so next we're going to cover types of certainty. Psychological, it's a bit of a sliding scale or the strength of your belief. Epistemic, it's binary. Roughly speaking, it's when a belief has reached the highest epistemic status. We would regard this as knowledge. So epistemic certainty and knowledge can be regarded as the same thing. And moral. So to cover psychological a little bit more, psychological certainty is commonly thought of as the feeling of being sure of something. When we think of it in terms of belief, we are largely talking about psychological certainty. Belief without knowledge only has psychological certainty. I can be sure I will wake up tomorrow, but I do not know that for a fact. Something unexpected might happen in the night, but I believe I will wake up. My belief is rational because I can justify it by I'm quite healthy. I'm in my 30s. I've got no major health concerns apart from the obvious back pain. Uh, and whilst I do acknowledge something could happen, that doesn't sway my certainty. In this instance, I can only really have epistemic certainty after the fact. epistemic certainty. Knowledge has epistemic certainty. This is usually coupled with psychological certainty, but not always. Consider a student taking an exam. They might know all the answers, but pressure, stress, the environment, etc. has caused enough doubt. They get everything right. They had epistemic certainty, but they did not have the psychological certainty because they were doubting themselves. They had no confidence in their own ability. Some regard epistemic certainty to be the same as knowledge, whereas others regard it to be a superior form of knowledge, not just meeting the JTB, but exceeding it. Moral certainty. Descartes says that moral certainty is certainty which is sufficient to regulate our behaviour, or which measures up to the certainty we have on matters relating to the conduct of life which we never normally doubt, though we know that it is possible, absolutely speaking, that they may be false. We will come a bit back to moral certainty later on, because um, Dave has a bit that we'll cover right at the end. Uh, but we're going to focus more on the um, psychological and epistemic for the, the, this, uh, this discussion. So next we have false certainty. It's quite easy to imagine a false psychological certainty. Uh, I mean, how often have we been confident that something was the case, but it wasn't? It could be a sports team winning, a friend helping you out, getting a job, doing well at something. So what then of false epistemic certainty. As I mentioned, epistemic certainty is more binary. You either have it or you don't. However, you can have psychological certainty that you have epistemic certainty when in fact you don't. An example of this, consider driving past a field. In this field, you see a ton of cows. You know you have seen a herd of cows in this field based on what you have seen. This is enough justification for a rational belief, and you consider it knowledge, and therefore think you have epistemic certainty. However, it turns out the cows were just cardboard cutouts that were really realistic looking. And whilst you were justified in your belief, the belief was not true. Instead of a justified true belief, you held a justified false belief. So this brings us on to the perception of knowledge. Consider a young earth creationist. They have been indoctrinated, homeschooled and everything they have been taught and are allowed to find out about the world concludes with it being about 6,000 years old. They are fully justified in holding that belief. It is rational until such a time they leave their insular bubble and start learning about things like the various dating methods. As mentioned, there are times we can hold a justified false belief. This means we have a rational belief, but it is not true, and therefore does not really count as knowledge. 
if we discover the belief is false, we are no longer in ju justified in holding that belief. So basically, magicians rely their entire career on a, a justified false belief. They make you believe one thing and then it turns out to be a trick and they've actually done something else. That's a, quite a good analogy for it, actually. Yeah. So to continue, they've now been presented enough information. This is the young Earth creationist we're talking about to conclude that the stories they've been told are, f uh, are false, regardless of if there's a deity or not. Uh, the world is clearly older than 6,000 years. If they then maintain their belief, it becomes irrational as it has lost its justification. This belief has now become an unjustified false belief. So when we consider justified and unjustified, we have four main categories. The justified, unjustified, and true or false. The justification has to match the claim for it to be truly justified. We will take a binary stance on justification for the sake of this argument. Partial justification will count as unjustified. So on the justified side, we can have a justified true belief, a fact that you believe and have justified to understand and can explain. It's knowledge. A justified false belief. It's a belief that you can justify as rational, but you are unaware of it being false. You have not been presented any evidence or information contrary to, to that nature. On the unjustified side, we have an unjustified true belief. So this is a belief that is actually true, yet you cannot fully justify it. Your understand uh, or your understanding of why you actually hold this belief be something as basic as my dad said. You know, um, my dad said that the Earth rotates around the sun. That isn't a full justification really i mean a, a child might be justified in in believing what their dad said but as an adult you need a little bit more thought behind it, your beliefs or it could be could uh couldn't it be something like my football team will win the league next year you don't really know that but if they do end up winning the league then it was unjustified but it was still true yeah, yeah, that that could be one of them. Yeah, I mean, if you, um, why would you have that belief if you didn't have a strong feeling? I mean, I know some people have that team pride. Because you support them, yeah. <laughs> but do the, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. I wonder if there is a little bit of a difference with that because at the point of belief, it's not true or untrue. It's a prediction not an actual truth value at that moment. But then you'd be thinking about probability theory. If we think about acting rationally is reasoning using the rules of logic and probability theory, if there you could justify it by saying that we have um, done all of this training, we have done brought all of these good players, these world class players, we won the last two seasons, uh, and our team is even stronger than it was. We can see that all the other teams haven't done as well. So, in so, which that, would that, make it a justified it prediction, would. It but would. not necessarily an unjustified true belief. So like I say, at that moment, it's not true or false. Uh, yeah, that, that's it's, true. It's de but that's kind of like uh, when you said earlier, Joe, that I I know that I'm going to wake up tomorrow. That's still going to be in the future, isn't it? It is, but yeah, I, I said I, I believe I will wake up in the morning. I don't necessarily know that to be true. I, I believe it. So okay, I would sorry, not call I don't use the wrong word there. <laughs> but I could also justify it. It's a justified belief, but I, as you say, until after the fact, I cannot get into the realms of it being knowledge. And lastly, an unjustified false belief. A belief you have weak justification for and is false. So again, that could be my friend said. She was pretty, so I thought she was 18. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so how does the knowledge and certainty tie in with propositional logic? So this is obviously a callback to 
um, the previous video. Uh, just we're going to be using the definitions that we did use in those in that video as well. So we discussed the propositional logic and how it can be used to provide an epistemological answer to the proposition God exists. Um, so we're now going to expand this further and break it down for how it can be used with knowledge and certainty. Things to remember. When you believe something, you don't necessarily know it. When you know something, you also believe it. You can only have epistemic certainty with knowledge. You can lack psychological certainty even if you know something. So if we go through this whole proposition of God exists, we've got this table in front of us. So we discussed the logical notations and how it would work for beliefs in the last video. Uh, we went through um, the question how it would be normatively defined, how the colloquial definitions work and everything like that. We are using the standard um, uh, normative definitions within philosophy. Um, you, you, I know some people don't necessarily agree with these definitions. Uh, that's fine. You're free to disagree with them. But for the sake of this argument, we have our, whether you believe or know God exists, you are a theist, right? Uh, your psychological certainty can be anywhere from, well, 0.001% strength belief all the way up to 100%. But if you have knowledge you're saying you have epistemic certainty and i don't think realistically anyone can make the claim that they have epistemic certainty a god exists and the the, the same thing for uh disbelief so this is belief god does not exist on the atheist side again you can have that psychological certainty but if you say i know no god exists I don't think you can have epistemic certainty of that. However, I do think that there are certain God claims that are so incoherent or fallacious that as described, we can say we know that that God doesn't exist, even if we cannot say we know no gods exist. Yeah, gods with mutually exclusive claims cannot exist as described. That, that doesn't mean that the people who are describing that God are correct in their explanation of it. It could be an existing God, but with different traits to what they say it has. Exactly. So that, that's the problem we have with a lot of the claims, is that they, they are so incoherent in one way, shape or another, and you're just looking at them and you go, the fuck, this God cannot exist because of X, Y, Z. So we can confirm that that's uh, unjustified. Uh, well, I, you, it depends on what your stance on that is. You could say if you well, believe, well, it's contradict. If it's a contradiction, then you can't you can't justify believing it. Then can you? No, no, no. Exactly. That's uh, that's what I was saying. It depends on which side of the angle you're taking about. I think you can be completely justified in believing that God does not exist, and I don't think that you can be justified in believing uh, a God that has contrary claims can exist as it is claimed to exist. You can still potentially have some form of rational belief in a deity, but just not the way most of them have been described. Joe just doesn't want to upset the deists. <laughs> well the whole thing with the whole deism it's basically the same thing as if a god does or does not exist anyway so it sort of reduces the point to being completely irrelevant they're just flaky, flaky aren't they, they? fucking deists <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just created everything and just fucked off that's it yeah. <laughs> so next we have uh, a little bit about how there can be a conflation around certainty Sometimes people conflate psychological and epistemic certainty. Uh, it's even more true if you're discussing an uh, epistemological belief position and say that you're certain. Um, it's quite a natural leap for someone to think you're speaking of epistemic certainty. I would generally, I would generally regard someone who says they are certain of their belief to be speaking of the strength of the belief and be talking about psychological certainty unless they say i know 
and that's the way I tend to differentiate. So if you're, uh, it's it's always best to ask someone if um, if they mean A or B. But the first step would be if they are discussing beliefs rather than knowledge. Assume psychological certainty and then confirm. And it goes for many different types of claim, not just religious ones. I know for a fact that my next door neighbour has two dogs. I can point at their house and say, I'm certain there's two dogs inside of there, which would be psychological certainty, but she might be taking them out for a walk. So it's not epistemic certainty. So I couldn't say I know there are. Yes, but equally, you could be epistemically certain that she does own two dogs. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Unless one has just died. (laughs) When you last saw her. I mean, you can caveat the shit out of it, but I think that we know where we're at, yeah? Yeah, I just wanted to give a bit of an example, taking it away from religion for the people who may not like us bashing it quite as much. I don't know why the fuck they're listening to this, but... (laughs) So what do you know? So far we've covered a number of theories of knowledge, perception of knowledge, colloquial definitions of knowledge and their problems, justification, certainty, both psychological and epistemic, how knowledge ties in with beliefs and logic, a few examples of the justified true belief, and next we should apply what we have discussed to some claims of knowledge that we commonly hear. I knew you'd say that. (laughs) So we're going to cover some theories of knowledge in regards to theological arguments. There's a number of arguments for the existence of God. Uh, These are touted by many theological philosophers as proof of God. And of course, they always assume that it's their God too. They might say that they know their God exists. Examples of these arguments that people used to say they know their God exists are the Kalam cosmological argument, the teleological argument, also known as the argument from design, or the ontological argument. So let's cover the Kalam. Whatever begins to exist has a cause of its existence. The universe began to exist and therefore the universe has a cause of its existence i reject p1 and p2 well let's have a look at it through the lens of all the different uh knowledge theories and we can see if it actually can stand up as knowledge under any of them So verificationism and positivism. Does anyone want to have a take a shot at this before I run through it? No, go for it, mate. (laughs) It definitely can't go under verificationism because you can't verify that everything that exists had a cause. And we can actually verify that some things do exist which don't have a cause, such as virtual particles in quantum physics. So it does not meet verificationism. And similarly for positivism, it can't be tested really either, can it? It, it, For both of them, that's the the reason I grouped them together is because it's basically the same example for both. You just have to sit there waiting for something to just pop out of thin air. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, sorry, I forgot what positivism was. So if we consider the first one, as you said, with both verification and positivism, we have no way to verify or test that this applies to all things. Therefore, this statement is regarded as meaningless. As such, we can say that this argument fails at the first hurdle with those two theories of knowledge. Dave, didn't you have a recent conversation with a guy um, (laughs) that was touching on this recently? And you got him to change his mind. Oh, that was about cause and effect. Oh, okay. That was well, close. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The part one of the Kalam is essentially a cause and effect argument. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, I, I remember the one you're talking about. That was the guy saying that God, God created, created cause, cause and, and effect. effect. But then if there was no cause, and you were saying if there was no cause or effect in the first place, then there was no way for God to cause cause and effect. So cause and effect would have had to have existed first. Yeah, pretty much. He wasn't so cocky by the end of the uh, argument. No, the, I read through the whole thing and I was just quite amazed with, with the way that you kind of untied his brain <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it just left him to just kind of say oh well yeah I kind of have to agree with you on that then yeah I was actually kind of shocked to be honest it doesn't usually happen so I'll give him some credit for that that's quite good it, yeah I mean it generally doesn't happen with anyone you're talking to I think I find generally on the internet with whether I'm speaking to a fellow atheist an agnostic a deist or any other form of theist Everyone is so firm and rigid in their opinion and you're trying to just have a discussion about something and they instantly get no, no, oh, and so defensive about it. And you just, I, I the, just... Argument, the argument becomes about them just trying to continue to prove how right they are and how you are wrong rather than them consider that they could actually be wrong. Exactly. Or taking the time to understand the other person's opinion. You know, it's, well, I've heard from enough other people that this is the right thing, so I'm just not even going to listen to you. Anyway. Uh, I mean, it must be quite difficult for these people who are often in their mid to late 40s to suddenly come up to somebody who can thoroughly take apart the foundational beliefs that they've built four and a half decades of their life upon they should but it can't be fucking easy yeah yeah that's fair enough i mean it it is hard i mean i think we all have uh, a bit of a an anchoring to to the things we do believe and it can always be um hard to reassess things i know sometimes when i am incredibly certain that i am right in what i believe it takes me a little while to suddenly take a step back and re-examine and then I'll go off and then look at different sources. But what I try and do is try and understand their position and um, find things that argue against me uh, as well as with me and look at the whole picture and try and form um, a, a more coherent belief set of why X, Y, Z. And it can be very difficult when you're talking against someone who is so rigid in their opinion. And you're going, oh, OK, well, explain this to me. And they're going, well, it just is. That's just the way it is. That is, it is, it is, it is. And you're just like, I mean, this isn't really having a discussion. You're just asserting you're, you're correct rather than actually doing anything to justify it. It's how I win all my arguments. <laughs> That's because you are always correct, Dave. Anyway, so we should now have a look at the clan cosmo cosmological argument under fallibilism. I forgot what that one means as well. So fallibilism is, it's like Popper's falsification. It's based basically around induction. You take something as true until it can be proved false. So with this one, everything that exists had a cause, or everything that begins to exist had a cause, that would be true or would be reasonable under fallibilism. Uh, the universe began to exist. I don't know if that would. So if we consider the first section... As far as we know, everything that begins to exist within the universe has a cause of its existence. Therefore, it can be considered true for now. However, the universe is not actually within the universe. So what makes us assume the universe would have the same rules of everything inside of it? If we are charitable for now and assume that the universe does have the same rules as everything within the universe, we can move on to point two. When we speak of begins, evidence points to the current state of the universe starting with the Big Bang. But we don't know if there was anything before the Big Bang 
and in fact the question is often thought as meaningless due to time starting with the Big Bang. We can only really detect what happens one trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after this Big Bang started occurring. There's lots of thoughts around quantum fluctuations and dark energy or even that the universe could go through an infinite level of bangs and crunches. Therefore, with so many variables that might be the case, we can say that the argument has actually failed at point two as well. Even if we did get to point three, the only thing we can really point to the cause of the current universe is the Big Bang. Coherence theory. So this is the one where all of your beliefs have to be coherent and consistent with each other. Does anyone want to have a go at that one? Yeah, I remembered what this one was. <laughs> Typically. <laughs> Look, the pretty pictures are distracting me. <laughs> if we were just discussing this, I'd have remembered all of them. I mean, that's a lie, but... <laughs> Your no, hair's actually I'm... blended in with the colour quite nicely, actually. The, yeah. Oh. Oh, so it is. I'm just going to lean over that way so it's right on the edge. Right. <laughs> so if we consider one and two, we might believe everything we know about does have a cause. But we also believe that we don't know about everything, because if we believe we know about everything, that belief then becomes irrational. Therefore, we cannot agree with point one without caveats. We believe the current state of the universe had a cause, which is the Big Bang, but we ought to remain agnostic, or in a state of unbelief, of anything before that, as presently there is no way to verify this. As such, we cannot call this knowledge with coherence theory either. So lastly, we'll come back to the justified true belief. Does anyone want to have a go at that one? Well, we, it comes back to the um, everything having a cause and uh, a cause, and you believe that everything has a cause, um, but it is unjustified because you don't know of everything having a cause. Am I close? <laughs> Uh, I mean, especially when we can demonstrate that there are things which don't have a cause. Oh, so it's definitely unju it's an unjustified false belief, then. Well, we we don't know if this particular belief would be true or false uh, a, as a whole, as in the Kalam cosmological argument. But yes. So point one would be unjustified and false. So. Whilst the justified true belief is the simplest form of knowledge, as mentioned, we have the problem between someone feeling something is justified and the justification matching a claim. So obviously that justification we we're talking about, about all things, um, you might feel justified in that, but we don't have enough knowledge about everything to actually demonstrate that. And as you say, Chris, it is definitely not all things because you've got those examples to as well that contradict that um so we also have problems where we don't necessarily know if something is true and that doesn't necessarily make it untrue of course but it makes it harder to actually justify and therefore call knowledge based on all the points that we've discussed before with all the other theories of knowledge i mean there, there isn't enough justification to make the belief rational for either point one or two of the Kalam argument and as such I do not regard it as knowledge under the JTB either. So in conclusion, using all theories of knowledge the Kalam does not hold up to scrutiny. Whilst you might have psychological certainty there is a deity there is clearly no epistemic certainty. Even if you accept all aspects of this premise you're still with left with a couple of issues. The cause is not necessarily a god. Even if that cause is a god, it says nothing for which god. And who caused that god? 
But, well, exactly. Yeah. Do you hit that infinite regress that's or the, whatever? Yeah, that's the thing. That's that's one of the uh, the atheist, uh, the, the you know the the new atheist um, Trump card, isn't it? Well, who who created that god? But to be fair, that is kind of true. Well, so it's, it's a bit of a silly argument, too, isn't it? Though, really, <laughs> if we are honest, it's it, it, it is yeah. like you say, forever regressive. There's the wonderful, um, is it dark matter? The YouTube cartoons, yeah, where I know God about. dies and goes to God's God, and then he dies and goes to God's God's God, and it goes all the way back until the first ever God, which I believe looked something like Steve Jobs. <laughs> so it's what we're supposed to infer from that that we're in a virtual universe. No, because if it was Steve Jobs, it would lag a lot more, and there'd be far more glitches. <laughs> and it'd be completely incompatible to anything. Actually, most of the universe is incompatible to our life, so perhaps it was. <laughs> Fuck, the universe is iOS, and we're the one app and... that runs properly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say pro you say properly. I don't know about that. Uh, well, uh, there's a bit just... of a virus problem right now. <laughs> yeah. Just when one of us gets deleted, we all do this. <laughs> so uh what about the other arguments i mentioned a couple of other arguments that are taken as knowledge these arguments are very similar to the clam in structure but do have slightly different outcomes when the various theories of knowledge are applied to them i figured it might be worth me reading out these arguments and you know anyone watching this video can decide if they can be counted as knowledge or not also if you guys would like to discuss them um on air i'm more than happy to as well so we've got the teleological argument the universe is a highly organized and complex system and one that is perfectly suited to causing particular effects some human-made objects are highly organized and complex systems and are systems that are perfectly suited to causing particular effects. Conclusion one, therefore, there are similarities between the universe and human-made objects. This is like the watchmakers, isn't it? It basically yeah. is. It's the argument from design. Where two things resemble each other, so too do their causes. Therefore, the cause of nature resembles the cause of human creations. Human creations are caused to exist by intelligent designers, Therefore, the natural world was caused by an intelligent designer. So, uh, unlike the others, I uh, unlike the clam, I haven't gone through this one bit by bit. If any of you want to have a, a have a chat and poke holes in it where you see them, feel free. I mean, the surely the best argument against this is that in nearly every complex system we see in the natural world we can measure the way that it's evolved down through to far simpler things so there's no reason to think of a designer we can see how it developed naturally from something far simpler into something complex say take the eye for example you get jellyfish which have just a few photoreceptive sensors on their heads, which for them is an eye because it's all they fucking need is to see which way the light is. And you can look at it step by step up until you get to the human eye is the one that they tend to argue for, uh, what's it called, irreducible complexity. But I mean, for fuck's sake, one, I need glasses. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> and two, the human eye isn't even close to being the fucking best. If I'm in a fucking hang glider three foot, 300 foot above the fucking floor, I can't spot a field mouse in the grass. But a fucking eagle can. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I do think that is I one couldn't of the... see a fucking field mouse if it was sat on the table opposite <laughs> me while I'm wearing my fucking glasses. Yeah, I do think that is one of the um, more obvious things to note is the fact one... that through evolution we can see every stage that goes back further and further getting simpler and simpler and 
yeah, what someone describes as to be the most super complex thing in the entire universe decided, oh yeah, well, we're just going to start with this single cell here and, and just let it happen over millions of years. Uh, I mean, that doesn't really sound like something that is being designed. I think uh, it, there's another way of looking at it is is P, from P1, it's not necessarily highly organized and complex. It's that we have put, we have applied our mathematics and science to uh, this system and the universe is just merely a reaction to what is the Big Bang. Um, therefore, it it would need a designer. So if you if you're playing snooker and you break, and all of the balls go everywhere, you could say you apply mass to that, all the geometry and all the uh, all the force needed to hit those balls into those certain um, angles and those certain places. You'd think, oh wow, that's that's pretty complex. If you actually look at the mathematics behind it, it's obviously simplified. But you could have just hit the balls in another way. And they could have ended up somewhere else, and you could have ended up. That, that's it's another one from the uh, the, inte the 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 design argument is that one millimeter out or one calculation that's not quite the same, and everything is di is everything's gone. Not necessarily everything's different. You'll get a different universe. You'll get different animals. You'll get different. Um, chemicals or anything uh, that's within the universe would just be slightly different doesn't mean that it's designed so I'd, I'd say from that point of view it falls down at p1 that goes to the whole um is it douglas adam who came up with the puddle the analogy, puddle analogy yeah. yeah 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 exactly yeah, yeah yeah so just because the water fits in the puddle this, this hole is perfect for me <laughs> Look, i fit into it exactly, exactly right you know The other one I see, which I think probably comes under the teleological argument, is when people compare, like you look at a picture of a galaxy, and then they'll compare that to the electrical activity in somebody's brain. It's like, look, they look the same. Is this just coincidence? Like, yes. <laughs> Correlation is not causation. Fucking exactly. But it can be an indication to set it can you off be, on yes. uh, an investigation to see if this actually did. And from from that, it could either be justified or unjustified. <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair, if you look at everything, you're going to find things which look similar to each other. We're fucking designed to. In air quotes, of course. But <laughs> we are pattern-seeking machines. It's what we do. Yeah, that, that's. I, I'm sure we've. We've. Well, I'm sure I've brought this up before. Is we, uh, as as humans, we are kind of looking to see faces and and stuff like that uh, that's similar to other humans in things like clouds and you know everything. I mean, how, many times, how many times has Jesus's face been in toast? Or a dog's ass. Or on a dog's ass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's called pareidolia, I think. You probably told me that before, but I've obviously since forgotten. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I had to look it up about 38 times before I remembered. So, Dave, two, you, then. <laughs> you've, you've actually um, taken this argument apart in, in one of your articles on design, on Answers in Reason. Do you want to uh cover off the the points that you think that um it falls down on well i kind of go with david hume's take in that if we see something like two effects that doesn't necessarily uh two similar effects it doesn't necessarily imply similar causes like um if you see stuff burning in the ground uh, burning on the ground in a forest, you might think, oh, campers set fire to something or kids or something like that, but it could just easy, easily have been a lightning strike from a thunderstorm. Um, so just because you see two similar effects, it doesn't necessarily imply two similar causes. 
And there's also the idea that the further away the similarity of the analogy, the less likely they are to be matching. So the universe might have some certain similarities to a clock, say, going with Paley. Um, but their causes are so far removed, you can't say very much about it. Um, and their similarities are so far removed. It, the, there's no real comparison to be made to draw any analogy from. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's that's basically the, the, the correlation causation argument, really, as well, isn't it? It is. Does it depend on the type of clock? I mean, <laughs> if it's a quartz-based clock, then maybe that book you bought me for my birthday, Joe, about crystal healing and chakras is actually completely true. <laughs> have, have you, have you, have you cured your gonna... diabetes yet? <laughs> Did you say corpse-based uh, clock? No. Quartz. <laughs> That's right. what I thought he okay. said at first. I was going to order one. <laughs> yeah, I tell you what, we should actually start... Uh, I suppose if Rick and Morty set him, you, you could turn him into a sundial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only if he was very happy the moment he died. <laughs> Oh, I want to go. And <laughs> it would have to be a very, very small clock because the shadow won't be very big. <laughs> cool. All right. Can you get a sundial wristwatch? I kind of don't. I'm see sure why I've not. seen one on like the Simpsons. I swear. I've seen him on the Flintstones, so Flintstones, they must be real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was on TV. It must be true. <laughs> So I think we've covered the teleological argument um, and we should move on. The ontological argument. By definition, God is a being which uh, that none greater can be imagined. A being that necessarily exists in reality is greater than a being that does not necessarily exist. Thus, by definition, if God exists as an idea in the mind but does not necessarily exist in reality, then we can imagine something that is greater than God. But we cannot imagine something that is greater than God. Thus, if God exists in the mind as an idea, then God necessarily exists in reality. God exists in the mind as an idea. Therefore, God necessarily exists in reality. Oh, what a load of hogwash. Circular reasoning fucking bullshit can piss right off <laughs> we think therefore god exists <laughs> yeah. Descartes did actually think something along those lines yeah the the full quote was you know i doubt therefore i think therefore i am therefore god exists or something like that isn't it i know i bastardized it but yeah yeah pretty much could you not apply this to any concept though Point to a being that necessarily exists in reality is greater than a being that not necessarily exists. Well, what if I imagine the necessarily greatest door that always leads right into the back of my pub's fridge? Well, I can think of it, so therefore it exists somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't exist by necessity, unfortunately. Though it should. Yeah, but then why would um, this being necessarily exist in reality either? Well, according to the arguments, he necessarily exists in order to solve problems like infinite regress and explain logic in the universe, you know, all that kind of stuff. This is God of the Gaps, isn't it? it so he necessarily exi exists to fill gaps in knowledge. Something like that. Sorry, I imagine that my dog can do that as well. <laughs> it, it leads to this the is door to the pub of the gaps. <laughs> so uh, basically, this this argument um, suffers from both circular reasoning and being a god of the gaps, and a bit of uh, presupposition as well. Is there anything else that we can quote about uh, problems with this argument? Yeah, 
that you can't just imagine something into reality. Not in the sense of an ontological being, anyway. Well, I'd agree with that. Yeah, uh, it'd be awesome if you could. <laughs> cool. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're not the Green Lantern. That's not how <laughs> shit works. And thankfully, no one is anymore. No, Ryan Reynolds is coming back. The Snyder Cut of Justice League as the Green Lantern. Oh, really? Brilliant. <laughs> there are definitely rumours. Has it been confirmed now, is it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I just saw the rumours and thought it was funny. Especially uh, after the end of Deadpool. <laughs> well, if you believe it, it might actually exist. <laughs> <laughs> that does actually make me think there are tons of things that I must have willed to be when I was a kid. Oh, I wish this would be the case. And then it actually was. And clearly it was all my imagination that made it happen. You I have changed COVID my mind 19. on this. No, I've changed my mind on this. By definition... Ryan Reynolds is the greatest Green Lantern, which none greater can be imagined. <laughs> Therefore, point two. <laughs> I, I think he's just the greatest in general, really, isn't he, though? He's fucking awesome. But anyway, back to the he's topic definitely. at hand. <laughs> I was going to say, his feud with Hugh Jackman is legendary. Oh, it's hilarious. So next we're going to come on to a topic of moral certainty slash knowledge. Um, I mentioned that briefly at the beginning. So um, I think we should cover this off. This is mainly going to be Dave fielding this one. So um, it's definitely worth addressing. Uh, and the first question we ask is, can we have moral knowledge? Well, according to the idea that we can hold something up and say this is morality, um, we can measure it, we can investigate it, we can't really say we know anything um, because we have no way of you know, verifying it or anything like that. It's a concept that Socrates sort of argues is just true opinion. Um, but there are cases where true opinion can be as good as knowledge. Um, and it, it's usually done through the virtues, so is virtue knowledge. Um, but there's, an, there's also the case where it's knowledge of how to behave. So it's not knowledge of, it's knowledge how. So sort of like riding a bike. You can say that you know how to ride a bike, but it's not really a true belief in the sense of the universe has a beginning, say. So it, going back to virtue, you could understand that moderation is obviously sort of tempering whatever it is that you're doing. So rather than eating your six pack of chocolate bars in one day, you have them over six days. So therefore you could have knowledge of how to apply moderation as a virtue. Exactly. Um, and there's this idea um, that most hold that you aren't really being virtuous unless you know why behaving like that is the right thing to do. If you're just copying somebody else, then you're just behaving a certain way rather than behaving in a moral way. So that comes back to the whole intent thing with morality, where um, if you are doing it because you're trying to do the right thing, then obviously you're intentionally acting morally. Whereas if you do the right thing by mistake, well, it was just a happy coincidence. And it's the same thing with a, a negative consequence. You know, if you happened to uh, do something, let's say you fired a gun up in the air, uh, you might have been irresponsible, but it hit someone, it's got a negative consequence, but that wasn't your intent. You were dumb, you were irresponsible, but you weren't intentionally acting immorally. Yeah, something like that. Um, so there is knowledge about morality, and applying morality is a form of knowledge. 
Um, but uh, you could never have something like epistemic certainty, basically. Can I just go back to what you were saying then? Uh, would that mean that doing something that is good because it's a rule, so going with deontology, it would never be virtuous to do it because the reason you're doing it is that it's in the rules to do so, not because you understand why it's a good thing to do it. There are two separate types of um, moral systems. Um, in the case of virtue, no, you wouldn't be doing it virtuously if you didn't realize why it was virtuous to do that. But in deontology, like especially a rule-based one, just following the rule is good. Cool. It would yes. be an unjustified true virtue. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose, I mean, it goes back to the whole consequentialist moral uh, theories as well. For example, the, the, the example I gave about shooting a gun, if there was a negative consequence, it comes back to it being immoral regardless of what my actual intent was. Yeah, that's it. Um, consequentialism, you could say, is knowledge of. You have to know the consequence in order to be able to determine it. Um, whereas something like virtue is knowledge how. Uh, sort of like manners. Manners isn't really knowledge, but it's knowledge how to behave in a certain situation. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So... I suppose we've covered off like uh, we can have at least with virtues knowledge how to act different behaviors um so would you say that, that then definitely with uh consequentialist moral theories and deontological uh, moral theories we can't necessarily have that same sort of knowledge how or is would we say with deontology, the only knowledge how is following the rules? Yeah, basically. Um, it, it's knowledge of the rules and then applying the rules. So uh, I suppose the next question, as we have discussed virtues briefly, is uh, what is virtue and what makes a virtue? This, again, is the question of knowledge. Um, there's the idea that it is just an opinion of the best way to behave. Um, Aristotle called it necessary for eudaimonia, uh, um, which is human flourishing, being the best that you can be kind of thing. Um Plato sort of puts it down to beneficial behavior patterns. At the minute, it's basically what the action that a virtuous person would take. So we wouldn't, a virtuous person wouldn't be dishonest. So therefore, honesty must be the virtue. But they also might temper their honesty to not necessarily be as blunt and hurtful with it they might be more cautious or prudent um, or might be dishonest in the attempt to protect people no because then you wouldn't be i suppose it would depend on how you look at it but because you would be being dishonest, then you wouldn't be behaving virtuously towards somebody. You should be as honest as possible. So could you say potentially that different virtues carry different weight? So protecting people would be virtuous and being honest would be virtuous. But if you had to be dishonest to protect people, the protection would hold more weight than the dishonesty if you would normally be honest. You would 
sort of meet halfway there and be honest while protecting them. Would that be sort of not telling the whole truth or telling misleading truths? So you could make true statements that don't necessarily put someone in danger. Uh, no, because you'd still be being dishonest, wouldn't you? Well, even if everything that you said were being true, so like we had with that whole um, when we were discussing Kantian ethics, and we were we were discussing the um, the whole uh, Jews hiding in the loft, exactly. with the Nazi death squad knocking on your door, and he would go, "Oh well, yes, I did see them on that street over there because he had seen them on that street over there. He just didn't answer the question of if they were in, you know, the loft." Uh, but obviously, in that instance, if they asked him, he would have to say, yes, they are in the loft. So virtuously, let's go with that. If we if if honesty is a virtue, but also being protecting protecting people is a virtue, um, then how would you uh, be as virtuous as you can be in that situation with the Jews in the attic? Which is why I think that you had different. Um quantities of or scores of virtue to each thing we act with prudence is is the thing where you're weighing it up i'm just wondering if you how they would answer that well yeah justice is quite a high one so you would be mixing justice in with that virtue and saying well you're not being dishonest as such um you're still being virtuous because you're sending the bad guy on a on a wrong thing. You're you're still doing the honest thing. Ah, so then we're not talking about dishonesty in the sense of lying. We're talking about honor more than honesty. Sort of, yeah. Um, you're doing the sort of best thing um your your intentions are to be just so you're being honest to the people that you're saving yeah i can get behind that yeah it's complicated eh? <laughs> It is. H hence the question is virtue knowledge. Well, you sort of have to be able to work out what the right thing is, so there is a certain sense of practical wisdom to it. So you that... could have a justified true belief that it's the best thing to or the most virtuous thing to send the Nazis away. Yeah, but how would you ever really... This is sort of what Socrates kind of gets at. You, the best thing you can do is come to as close to a true opinion as possible without ever actually being able to fulfill the JTB thing. So what actually makes that different? Because you mentioned that earlier, and I was going to bring it up then, but the conversation went on and I missed the point. Uh, what's the difference between a true belief and a true opinion? Uh, or is it no, basically synonymous and the difference is whether it can be properly justified or not? Yeah, that's it, the latter. Um, a true opinion is basically a true belief. Um, but like you say, it's missing the actual ability to justify it as knowledge. Cool. Yeah, sorry, I heard you say that earlier, and I wanted to jump on it, and then Joe went off on one of his silly tangents or whatever, and I missed the opportunity completely. Sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Joe. <laughs> Pretty sure that's not what happened at all, but I'm going to throw you under the bus instead of me. It's all right, I'm it's used to it. It's happening all the kid. time at the moment. <laughs> so, obviously, if we know what a virtue is and how you uh, have to try and apply it and work out you know what is most virtuous um can you teach someone that 
Can you teach virtues to people? I think you can. Um, in the Mino, Socrates kind of argues that only sophists teach virtue and there are no real teachers and that virtue is learned. You sort of pick it up from other people and then start to think about it and it becomes part of your habits. Um, but I'm pretty sure you could translate that into teaching. If you can't teach virtue, then the end of the good place would have been very different. <laughs> pretty much. But again, that would be learning virtue rather than being taught virtue. You're picking it up rather than having somebody over top of you giving you propositions. Don't you shit on all of Cheedy through season one, you bastard. I will. <laughs> No, he's one of my favourite characters ever. Yeah, it's an interesting one. So, I mean... You can how... certainly be taught the concepts and the ideas, but can you be taught to actually be virtuous, I suppose, would be the distinction. Yeah, that's exactly it. Is, isn't is that basically like manners as well, though? Like with kids, you have to constantly tell them to use their fork uh, and knife properly, hold them in the right hand, say please and thank you. And eventually it becomes more automatic if you've at least been doing it right and they just instantly say thank you as things go. And it becomes second an nature. So could that happen with virtue as well? You're constantly trying to, I suppose, indoctrinate uh, in a way these things into people to make them act that way. Is that There's an argument there to say, to say that they're not actually being virtuous, they're doing it by habit. Yeah, that's it. Um, that, that's sort of what Aristotle kind of gets at. It is picked up in that way, the same way that manners are picked up by kids. But, but there's the added element where you have to understand why it's right for it to be a virtue. Yeah, that, that's fair enough. So if, if you get this understanding um but eventually you get to a point where it is becoming uh, automatic and you no longer think about it it just becomes part of your nature so you understand why it's virtuous but you just act that way do you stop being virtuous at that point because it has become habit no i wouldn't say so because you still have the understanding of why it's right you're not just performing the action because you've seen somebody you admire perform the action. What about if you did the action enough for it to become habit when you understood why it was virtuous, but then forgot and carried on doing it anyway? The knowledge would still be there and it you, you could cook it back out of you, so... You could have learned the habit I because would... it was virtuous and therefore you would continue to do that out of habit knowing that previously that's what you'd kind of taught yourself. Yeah, I mean, I suppose you could make some really random outlier type argument where someone gets brain damage and completely forgets everything but still has the habits. So at that point, are they acting virtuously? And... Uh, that's that's an interesting one. I suppose technically they're they're not, are they? They're just acting on habit at that stage because they no longer understand what is virtue and why it's right. That knowledge is not there within them at all. Just the habits remain. Yeah, but that's overcomplicating the issue for this video. Oh, definitely, definitely. It's um, and I think it's going to be one of those examples that will probably you know, never actually be a, a reality, really. It's an interesting one for a thought experiment. So say somebody with Alzheimer's, would it still be virtuous or not? But really, does it fucking matter? But yeah, it would be an interesting thought experiment in a episode where we come back to exploring more of those. Awesome. Um, is there anything else you think we need to cover off on moral certainty or knowledge, Dave? 
No, that gives you some grounding of how difficult it is to say that we can have moral knowledge, but there are types of moral knowledge. Yeah, wicked. No, thank you very much for that. So tonight we have covered the theories of knowledge, types of certainty, the application of these theories, colloquial definitions of knowledge and their issues, justification, moral knowledge and certainty. And are there any other questions or thoughts on tonight's topic? Just to say, don't forget to look at moral nihilism, uh, epistemological nihilism. The idea that you can't truly know anything? Yeah, pretty much. See, I have been learning. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Anyone else have anything else? No, that was interesting. I enjoyed that. Yeah, same. All good. Yeah, different ch uh, change of pace. New medium to, to work with. And... Uh, Hopefully the um, video will turn out all right. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I quite enjoyed doing it this way and, and having our, our uh, overall sort of show um, a little bit more planned uh, as well. I find it a bit easier to, to at least stay on topic of what we're actually trying to discuss when we've got some clear and concise points in front of us. <laughs> I will say that the only issue I have with this format is, as I mentioned earlier, with the pictures, I take less in than if I was just listening, but that might be my somewhat magpie nature. And there's a picture of me and I can see me doing stuff and it's terribly distracting. Close your <laughs> eyes then. <laughs> uh, well, on that, you could have just selected the um, the one that is in the middle and just blown that up so you only saw that bit and the rest of them would have been hidden. You can sort of choose to have one blown up above the rest uh, and focus on just the, the other bit. I can, but I like looking at me. I'm pretty. <laughs> I think you want to focus more on Joe's door just in case something happens again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, no errors in recording this evening. <laughs> I noticed that he's kind of angled his camera. Away from the door. Yeah, that was definitely interesting. I mean, it, it would have been even more difficult tonight because what I've been doing tonight is um, going back and forth between um, the, um, uh, the the PowerPoint that I put together and the cameras of you guys. Whereas last week I didn't have the ability to to do that as easily. I hadn't um, hadn't really set things up as well as I have now. Um, so yeah, that could have been really embarrassing for Katie if you know the entire world had seen her walk in without any clothes on. <laughs> I think you're overestimating our audience. That's right. <laughs> Uh, if it, it's a there good had way been of boobies, the yeah, if there had been boobies, there would be a hell of a lot more people watching the videos. <laughs> Although it would get cropped, wouldn't it? <laughs> that <laughs> clip would be taken out. No, you know that's going to have time to practice now. <laughs> you know we're going to go streaming live on Twitch, and that'll happen, and we'll all be banned on our first show within five minutes. <laughs> I didn't realise you were recording tonight. <laughs> Cool. Awesome. Well, um, thank you very much, guys. It's been uh, fun doing this topic. This has been Fresh Air covering knowledge and certainty. And I'm fairly certain that I'm Joe. And I'm fairly certain I'm Dave. I know that I'm not Dave. <laughs> and I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> Good night, <laughs> all. <laughs>